Hey, hey, all you beautiful people, Mike or O'Carroll here, Mr. Utah Real Estate, coming back at you with another rip of our podcast episodes with our series Living in Utah. Uh, and with today, uh, we're all about three weeks out from Halloween, right? Three weeks out. So we, I thought we'd uh, tackle some uh, Halloweenish kind of stuff, even wore my orange shirt. I didn't. Do I look like a big pumpkin? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about real estate. What's going on with real estate? Well, let's talk about some uh, ghost towns. I think uh, this was one that Derek here, he wanted to really do. He wanted to tackle the ghost towns and haunted locations in Utah. So. Well, you know, it is uh, Halloween time, and people around here especially, they love Halloween. Did you know that Utah was actually voted, just voted nationally, number one state in the entire country for Halloween decorations? Yeah, I did see that. I saw that come over my news feed. Yeah. Yeah. And I love Halloween. That's my favorite time of year. And I'm kind of a little bit biased because my birthday is four days before Halloween. So I've always loved Halloween my whole life. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't think there's anybody on my street that doesn't decorate. Everyone decorates. They got like spook alleys and all kinds of stuff going on in my street. Yeah, my, my neighborhood's not as much. I don't think there's an, as many little kids in my neighborhood. So You live in a geriatric yeah, neighborhood. Um, I, I, I get a little bit disappointed every year. We get the big bowl of candy, and we get maybe a, you know, 10, 10 knocks on the door throughout the whole night. Kind of a bummer, but, but, we, yeah, but, but we did take a, I took my grandson to your neighborhood last year, and I think we're going to bring him back again this year because your neighborhood kicked our neighborhood ass. rocks Man, you know that what? Was some cool stuff going on and my kids are still little we literally have only gone over like a couple of streets from my house like every year like when the kids get older we'll venture out throughout the entire neighborhood they have so many spook houses and so much stuff going on in my neighborhood they got people out in their driveway like bonfires like come over here and make us s'mores you know yeah. all this stuff it's so great yeah your neighborhood was pretty cool there's that one house had the big old freaking dragon out there in the front yard and yes purple lights and, and oh they're putting them amazing. up now they're putting them up yeah, now that was it was pretty cool stuff yeah every day when i drive by i see more and more and more but so uh yeah let's go ahead and get on into this here so we're going to talk about for a little bit um utah ghost towns Ooh. and uh I don't know if you knew this or not, but Utah has over 100 ghost towns. Yeah, well, we were, you know, back in the old Western days, how huh? we were part of that uh, come out west and find gold and silver and oh, yeah. a lot of those old abandoned mining towns. And most of them, uh, most of the ghost towns are abandoned mining towns. Yep. Um, so, yeah, the, the first one we're going to talk about is a town called Grafton. Um, it actually uh, started in 1862, and it was more like a like a plan B to a, a town called Wheeler. Um, but the Virgin River, if anyone has ever driven down to Las Vegas, you guys go through the, the Virgin River Gorge, right? The, that really crazy, pretty road um, and all the scenery over there. But um, So the Virgin River, every time I look at it now, there's hardly any water in there. So it's hard to imagine that it ever flooded like that, but... This town, Wheeler, used to get flooded by the Virgin River all the time. And so Grafton was a plan B. And at its peak, get this. You ready? At 168 people. <laughs> that was at its peak. So um, I don't know back in 1862 if 168 people was a lot. But it was only, uh, so it was 168 people from 28 families. Dang. So they were Mormons probably. Probably. That would be my guess. So they tried about, growing. So 20-something uh, families, 160, so that's what, about four, five, six, six people per family around I there? I suck at math. But anyway, they all had farms. They all needed help, and that's pretty much why the Mormon families had big families back then, because they all had a plot of land that needed working. So, you know, they were just <laughs> pumping out babies one after another back then. But, um, but down there in Grafton, you know, they tried growing cotton. But the the environment's very harsh, you know, down there. Very so, dry. Very, very dry. So, and, you know, back then, apparently the Virgin River flooded quite often. And uh, so, started in 1862. By 1890, only four families remained there. And so, by 1920, only three families. And the church closed there in 1921. You know it's bad when the church closes. Yeah, they're like we're not get, we're not getting any more tithing here. We need to move on. Come on over to St. George. Yeah. So, but um, the church closed in 1921. The last couple actually moved away in 1944. So they held on for a little while there. 
So, um, and Grafton is actually the most photographed ghost town um, out there. I think you might have seen Grafton in a few movies, huh? Yeah, um, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with Robert Redford and uh, Paul Newman. That's have you ever seen that? That's a great show. Oh my gosh, I love that a, show. That's a classic. Um, and I didn't realize that was here in, in the Grafton, the ghost town Grafton. I didn't realize that until we started researching this. And oh, like, yeah, yeah, cool. Oh yeah, you know, um, Butch Cassidy is actually from Utah. Yeah, he's from Circleville. Yeah, I visited his house a couple years ago. It was well, pretty. Pretty Robert cool. Robert Redford has some property out this way too. He runs the Sundance. Uh, oh, okay. I believe he owns Sundance, and that's one we forgot actually. Yes. One of the ski resorts we forgot in our first episode of Sundance. Sundance Ski Resort, the Sundance Film Festival, and he owns that, and so he he really loves Utah. Oh yeah, he, you ever seen Jeremiah Johnson? I don't think I've seen that. Really, I thought everyone in school watched Jer. It's uh, Jeremiah Johnson. His name was Liver Eaton Johnson. He was a he was a badass. He used to kill all the Indians around the area and. So finally, um, they like ambushed him, tried to anyway. Every chance they got, they tried to kill him, and he killed all the Indians. And so finally, they had respect for him because they didn't want to get killed anymore. Was that a movie? Yeah, Jeremiah Johnson. Um, and Robert Redford actually plays Jeremiah Johnson, and it's shot over by Sundance where his property is. Hmm. It is so beautiful over there. Yeah, beautiful area. So, but anyway, so that that's Grafton, and it's, it's down in St. George. Let me give you the... Uh, I don't have longitude or latitude or anything, but it's in the southwest corner of Utah, and it's about an hour northeast of St. George. So, St. George, start your clock, go northeast. It says here also on Wikipedia, they also shot Old Arizona down there. Nice. Never saw that movie, but... Uh, I might oh, have actually, to. it says here, so in, in, in 1929, Old Arizona was shot there. It was the first talkie film talked film out filmed outdoors huh. so back before or back when there was all the silent films it yeah. was one of the it was the first film shot outdoors that they actually spoke in the film interesting yeah i'm sure the uh, actors loved it because they were sick of going <laughs> <laughs> but yeah any, any cool other things about grafton that i didn't mention no uh, that pretty much covers it and um, i'm gonna leave a link for y'all in our description down here so we can come check out some of these places and uh, yeah we'll we'll throw some pictures up as well and they still have um uh you know while we're we're gonna go into haunted utah here next but um they actually have one on on grafton so uh, i'll just talk about that real quick a lot of people that go down to grafton they still have the cemetery there um they still have i believe the uh the wells fargo office there um and city hall is down there still it's just a little building but a lot of people that have gone down there, when they get close to the cemetery, they hear like a crowd of people talking like they're like they're talking very seriously about something. And then when you get closer, it's like they notice you and then they stop talking. Hmm. So a lot of people have reported, you know, hearing that again, everything I didn't say. It yeah, but anything that we say about people seeing ghosts and what they've reported and all that, that's just what we've heard it's not first-hand knowledge so it's really tough to say what's going what people see and, and you know what's going through their brain so i like to think that it's real yeah anything's possible anything anything's possible i think ghosts are around us all the time some people can see them but some people can't maybe they have like a whole society a ghost society around us that we can't see yeah, I mean, I've never personally experienced anything, but I know people that have, and they're credible people, and people I know and love, and they've, you know, seen and felt things. So, I've yeah, I've had I've had some experiences myself. When we went down to uh, when we went over to Virginia City and we walked through the Owashu Club, oh, yeah. I don't know, I I I. I I think I felt some things. I mean, I felt some coldness and breezes when there was no windows and stuff like that. And It was hot outside, too. Yeah, so, I mean, I haven't debunked it. There could have been something else, but who knows? Maybe I did feel something. I don't know. I wish I could have been there with you guys, but I got in trouble that day. Um, maybe we'll go into it in another episode why I got in trouble. But I wasn't with you guys at the Wash Show Club, and I regret that. But we'll go back there. Yeah. We'll go back but that's there. Nevada. Let's get back to Utah. Okay, so the next one we want to talk about. So, we'll, uh, like Micah said, we'll, he'll leave a link for Grafton. Uh, everything that we're going to talk about, he's going to leave a link. So. Yeah, I'll put links down in the description for everything we're talking about yeah, today. It's very, very interesting. So, so the another ghost town, this is kind of a unconventional ghost town, so to speak. Um, it's a town called Thistle. And um, it's up Spanish Fort Canyon. 
and it was founded in 1863 as an agricultural community and there were also like a lot of cattle ranches in the area and um, in 1878 they said hey guys we're gonna put a railroad through here and everyone was like oh my god that's great so they had to stop back back then at thistle because you know the the railroad the locomotives couldn't go very far because they were running on steam so that actually was a stop and those little boom towns where there were stops um you know they were happening places for a little while so you know at its peak in 1900 guess how many people called it home how many 600 <laughs> that's pretty big that's pretty big for that little area if yeah. you've ever seen it so 600 people were hustling and bustling there every day and you this know? little spanish fort ten is not too far from us it's about an mm -hmm. hour's drive from us about an hour's drive yeah. Um, but you know, they had, uh, it was a really cool, uh, little town. They had a train depot, a s school, post office, barber shop, uh, saloon, several restaurants. So, I mean, they had everything they needed over there, but, um, in the 1950s, they invented diesel trains. So they didn't need as many stops, you know, along the way, cause they didn't have to fill it up with water. So just kind of. Thistle wasn't a stop anymore. And it's passed on by Thistle now. Yep. Kind of, a uh, kind of on the wayside. And so fast forward to 1983. So there were a lot of buildings there and all that. They were abandoned. 1983, there was a torrential rainstorm and it caused a massive landslide over there and there was mud and it covered the whole town and it was so deep. It was 200 feet deep. Dang. And uh, it caused a huge dam that was 200 feet high and it dammed up the Spanish Fork River. And so it actually cut off the the train lines too from salt lake to denver so they had to actually it was such a big chore even in the 80s to get all that earth out of the way they actually had to reroute it was cheaper to reroute the railroad tracks mm. <laughs> around it <laughs> so it's crazy but um caused over 200 million in damages and, and back then that was 1983 so 200 million so that's what probably close to a billion dollars nowadays i would imagine but um, well, in the last two years, it's probably now two billion. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, eight billion dollars. But um, now, what you can see basically is uh, you know, there's a few little houses that you can see, but most mostly you just see kind of roofs because it's underwater still. Um, but that that's thistle. Um, people that have gone up in that area, uh, I mean, there's times when the water's high and low, you know, and all that stuff. So if you know when to go there when it's low, you know, you can go there and check it out. But people have re reported hearing uh, loud screams and disembodied voices around there. Yeah, so I would assume towards the end of the summer is the best time to go. Probably. When the water levels come down. And yeah, probably. When the spring runoff is done and the water levels come down towards the end of, of summer. So a lot, yeah. a lot of it's underwater, but I, uh, I wouldn't doubt you hear screaming. Sheesh, can you imagine that? A big old landslide. I'd be like, landslide. Wonder, I wonder how many underwater ghost towns there are. You know, I wonder if there's any um, like bodies under there still that they haven't <laughs> gotten out. You know what I mean? That's what I always wonder about things like that. Like, did they get everybody out of there? Like, are there all, they're all restless bones spirits? Now. Restless spirits. Yeah, I mean, with the what, the the was the flood flooding landslide. Flooding, so who knows? There might be something there. I don't know. Maybe one day they'll be doing an archaeological expedition to find all these like skeletons. That'd be crazy. But so that's thistle. Um, you got to look out for it because I've actually driven by it many times. I'm like, oh, oh, oh wait, that's thistle. That, there we go. Is it, is it right in? I mean, if you're taking the the Spanish Fort Canyon, taking kinda, that road through, you'll go right past it. It's kind of right in the canyon, and, and this, you know, as you're going up, it's on the left hand side. Because I've taken that road a few times, and mm -hmm. I just probably never even noticed it. Like I say, you have to look because all you can see is kind of roofs just sticking up, looks like out of the water, and that's that was thistle. <laughs> but. They say all the uh, canyons here are haunted, actually. But you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. they they hear screaming and all that. Imagine that in the dead of night, like it's so pitch black up there in here. <laughs> well, well, I would poop my well, pants, <laughs> literally, as the kids like to say. Well, we are we are an outdoor recreation state, so there's I'm sure been quite a few accidents in a lot of these areas, and I'm sure a lot of people have pooped their pants too. You know. Is that what you meant by accidents or other accidents? <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of accidents here. They actually have Depends vending machines. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. So, uh, okay, so that was Thistle. So the next one is Castlegate. 
and that's in Carbon County. Uh, Carbon County is actually uh, by price, and that's on the way to Dinosaur Land. It's just pretty cool. We'll talk about Dinosaur Land another time um, when we get into really cool places. But so Castlegate, it's located 90 miles southeast of Salt Lake City. Castlegate was established in 1886 as a coal mining town. So like I say, most of these ghost towns, they started as mining towns. We have a lot of minerals and a lot of resources here in Utah. Um, but Coke ovens were constructed to provide Coke for the smelters in Salt Lake. Co I cocaine? I don't know they did Coke like that back then. Like Coke? Like Coke, Coca-Cola or Coke, like cocaine? Or, well, or, is there, or is there a third Coke? <laughs> well, you know, well, unfortunately, I think it's uh, like a mineral. It's called yeah. Coke. Um, when I lived in Maryland, we're talking about Utah, but I'll talk about Maryland. In Maryland, there's a road called Roman Coke Road. Roman Coke. So if you say it real fast, Roman Coke Road. But anyway, they had Coke ovens in Castlegate. And I imagine huge piles of like this white powder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. And it might be. It might be. I don't know what it is. But apparently they need Coke to uh, mix it in with, you know, the gold and all that stuff to kind of separate it out. You know, when they do the smelting and all that stuff. It's one of the separators, I guess it's called. Um, so they had Coke ovens there, and they were constructed to provide Coke for the smelters in Salt Lake. And these guys were running around all day like... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Um, so there were three... <laughs> There were three coal mines in the area, and in 1924, um, an open flame ignited the coal dust, uh, causing an explosion in mine number two. And if you know about the, you ever seen the uh, the mining equipment they had back then? Yeah. It was like a like a reflector thing with like a candle that they just put right on top of their hat. Yeah. And so you know, back they're, before batteries. Yeah, you know they're mining coal. And all the dust is there, and boom! And so it exploded, which caused another huge explosion, and uh, it destroyed everything. And um, you know, a lot of people were killed, a lot of miners were killed. Um, so there now, um, they still have some remnants of the coke ovens there. Um, if you bring like a razor blade or something, you might be able to scrape it off and get a little, you know, a little something. Um, <laughs> so you're all full of jokes today so there are so there's some foundations left um, where you can see uh, some remnants of the coke ovens and they have the cemetery cemeteries are always what remains you know so they always leave the dead bodies back behind well i mean if i actually want to go look at this uh, with my own eyes because uh, most of the headstones there they were from the 1918 uh, flu epidemic um the spanish flu that was actually started by our government but anyway we'll go into that another time so most of the headstones are from 1918's flu epidemic and from the 1924 um, when the mine exploded and you know it killed killed a lot of miners so you know there there's quite a few ruins there to explore and uh people that have visited there they've reported hearing screams and strange lights things like that i'm thinking maybe that i was thinking like the strange lights might be like the ghosts of the miners with those little the little candles on top of their hat kind of they don't know they blew up you know? well did you know some of the historic events there tell us about so it. over here on wikipedia it says the uh, castle gate the town is famous for two historic events on april 21st 1897 butch cassidy butch and Elsie cassidy. lay held an employee of the pleasant valley coal company in a daylight robbery at the busy railroad station in castle gate making off with seven thousand in gold Butch Cassidy was the man. Yeah, so he they uh, never killed anybody he, either. Apparently, he did one of his robberies over there in, in the uh, Castlegate Railroad Station, seven thousand in gold, which is uh, I don't know what it is now, but that's a lot of money. There's uh, plenty of movies out there on Butch Cassidy. He was uh, he was pretty smooth, you know, for back then. He was a very very smart guy. And then to, to hit on the point you were talking about on March eighth, nineteen twenty four, the Utah Fuel Company's Castlegate Mine Number no. Two exploded. Killing 172 miners. Fatalities, fatalities included 49 Greeks, 22 Italians, 8 Japanese, 7 English, 6 Australians, Austrians, sorry, 2 Scots, 1 Belgian, and 76 Americans, including 2 African Americans. It was the third deadliest disaster in the history of coal mining in the United States at the time and remains the 10th deadliest at present. Wow. 174 so, miners. Can you imagine? Or 172. 172. Can you imagine? 
like you're alive, you're alive, boom, like you're dead. Yeah. I, I imagine there's a lot of ghosts around that area, so especially ghost, like where the mines ghost were. town literally. Literally, yeah. I'd like to go check out right up over by where the mines were supposed to be. That would be that'd be pretty cool. I bet you that's what the strange lights are. All those miners walking around with those things on there. Yeah, their 172 of them died, so I mean a lot of them probably don't even know they're dead. They're just kind of well, what the hell are still these still mining? The hell are these things on wheels riding around here? Poor guys. I mean, the mining jobs are the tough one as it is, and they're still mining in their death. Jeez. Man, <laughs> with a candle on their head. <laughs> Lord have mercy. No. I have no idea how they did stuff back then. It's so, so laborious, you know? Well, there was, and there was no OSHA back then, too, so. Yeah. And can you imagine trying to light up a cave? You've been in a cave before, right? With yeah. a flashlight. Most flashlights suck. Can you imagine trying to mine black coal with a little candle on your head? Like, <laughs> well. Man. No, thank you. Man, those hats off. Hats off. To oh, you guys. I'd rather be an outlaw. Me, me too. <laughs> I would rather be like Butch Cassidy. <clears throat> Again, he's from Circleville. So if you guys want to go check it out, his boyhood home is in Circleville. Okay, so so that was uh, that was Castle Gate. Again, that's go, that's in price. That's going on the way to uh, Dinosaur Land. Yeah. So this one, um, apparently I've been pronouncing it wrong for a long, long time. And I'll um, let you pronounce this one because I tried it. And <laughs> uh, I'll, I'm probably going to butcher it, but I'll, I'll see if I can get close. So the, the spelling is I-O-S-E-P-A. Apparently it's pronounced Giuseppe. So Giuseppe, okay? Um, that's in Skull Valley. Now that's out in Tooele County. Tooele County is past the other point in the mountain, right? Tooele County is west of us. Yep. So if you're heading from Salt Lake City, if you go west off I-80 towards... See the big smoke stack over there. You yeah. know, you can see it from across the valley. So if you took I-80 all the way out west, you'd end up in San Francisco. But um, yeah. about what, 30 miles outside of Salt Lake City, I think. It's about yeah. Tooele. Yeah, it takes about 40 minutes to get out there. And then that's Tooele County. It's basically uh, where the Ochre Mountains are. It's on the other side of the Ochre Mountain Range. Little town there. Um, I don't think it's like right there. I think you have to drive out a little bit because it's uh, in Skull Valley. And so basically the... Uh, we, used to go, we used to go camping in Skull Valley when I was a Boy Scout. Really? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know there was a, a, a ghost town out there too. It would have been cool to check that out when I was a Boy Scout. Yeah, you know. You guys might have been camping there. Maybe. You know. So, uh, so uh, Giuseppe, um, the, it, it came about because, uh, you know, Mormon missionaries in the 1850s um, they started settling in Polynesia. Um, that's Polynesia's Tonga, Samoa, Hawaii, Hawaii, Fiji, you know, Fiji, all those. I looked at a map of it, and yeah, it's all it's all those uh, ba- basically Pacific Islanders, right? And so by the 1870s, um, Native Hawaiians were starting to settle in the Salt Lake Valley, and I can only imagine back then, 1870s having all these huge Hawaiian, because they're big, they're big people. You know? big. I'm, not, I'm not saying nothing bad or anything. They're huge. I've got a little bit of Hawaiian in me. That's, that's, why, that's why I blame my bigness. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you never know. That's true. You have a Filipino in you too, right? I got some Filipino. I got some Hawaiian. Most of it's like Irish, English, French, but I got a little bit of the other stuff too. That's cool. You're Heinz 57 like me. I'm all mixed up. Like most people. But so, so, the, so the native Hawaiians came here. And the people were probably like, oh, my God, like, who are these people? Because, you know, I mean, dark skin, they probably had afros, you know, and tattoos because they had tattoos, you know, back then. And so. Uh, Which was not the uh, highly looked up. It was frowned upon at the Mormon religion. Very, tattoos. very frowned upon. Very, so they were savages, basically, to these people. But through all of the uh, negativity that they encountered, they persevered. And they started their own settlement over in Skull Valley in Tooele County. And so um, over there, at its peak and stuff, they had homes, schools, stores, of course a church, you know, because they they were Mormon. Um, That's why I'm uh, It's kind of, I know it was way back when, but, you know, even the Mormon people were treating them bad when you're supposed to treat everyone well, right? But... You know, that was, that was a different time. It was a different time, so I guess we can't be too hard on them. But So as you can imagine, if you've ever been out on the other side of the mountains, it's pretty harsh out there. It's just straight-up desert, pretty much. I mean, yeah. there's, there's not cacti or anything There's out there, nothing out there. It's just sagebrush, sagebrush you know, and dirt and all that stuff. So it is a very harsh environment. Very dry. And so, you know, these poor people, they're out there trying to grow food, 
and it's very harsh. And so they had, you know, quite a few crop failures. And, you know, with that obviously comes disease. Uh, disease was rampant. They had uh, many cases of smallpox, leprosy, diphtheria, pneumonia. And uh, by January of 1917, Giuseppe was a ghost town. So it didn't last very long. Um, but as you know, we have a lot of Polynesian uh, people here in Utah. And um, you know, that's, I think that's one of the things that makes Utah unique as well. I think we have a very high population compared to other states, you know. And um, so in 1971, uh, Giuseppe was placed on the National Historic Registry. And a Memorial Day um, for the settlers of that area was organized in 1980. And so every year they have a celebration out there and they have plumbing out there. They have restrooms, which is good because that many people going out there wouldn't be good without a restroom. Um, but uh, apparently there's a lot of uh, ruins out there still. And so it's a pretty cool place to explore if you ever want to go out there. Um, what are you looking up there? What are you so I got guys? on here on Wikipedia. So the desertion of Giuseppe. Did I say that right? Close enough. And if uh, someone wants to tell us exactly how to pronounce that. but uh, So in, in, in 1915, Joseph F. Smith, then president of the LDS Church, announced plans for the construction of the temple at Lai of Hawaii, <laughs> which is the uh, temple, the Hawaii, the Hawaii temple on the north shore of Oahu. That's been there that long? Yeah. And so, well, they announced the plans to build it then. And the first such temple to be built outside of the continental North America uh, the Hawaii Temple brought Giuseppe to an end. Although Mormon's leaders, although Mormon leaders did not advise Giuseppeans to immigrate to Hawaii, the church did offer to pay passage of any who wished to move but couldn't afford it. So most of them packed up and said, "We're going back to Hawaii." I'm sure they did. That's like shipping the homeless people over. Well, why wouldn't you? I mean, you're in the middle of a desert with no water. Why wouldn't you want to go back to Hawaii? Right? I would love to go to Hawaii. So they paid for them to go back, and it sounds like they all said, "Yep, let's go." And they all packed up and left. So by 1917, Giuseppe was a ghost town, and the land was sold yeah. to the Desert Livestock Company. Little remains of the town, other than cemetery, the cemetery, and a fire hydrant. Yeah, and bathrooms. <laughs> and bathrooms. Well, out there you can go pee anywhere. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. But, uh, yeah, people go camping out there. They do have that celebration um, out there every year. Yeah. So maybe you can read about that a little bit more. So it says here, like you said already, in 1971, the cemetery was placed in the National Registry of Historic Places. Um, in 1980, a Memorial Day activity was organized at Giuseppe where a few Utah Polynesian families some descended from the Losepians, repaired the fence and the beautiful graveyard area. This marked the beginning of an annual tradition that continues to grow. In the mid-1980s, the Giuseppe Historical Association was incorporated to foster appreciation of Utah's Polynesian heritage and history. The association works to preserve town sites and, or, and organize the festival. Uh, August 28, 1989, Giuseppe's centennial president, Gordon B. Hinckley of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints dedicated a monument at the cemetery featuring a bronze bust of the Polynesian warrior. That Memorial Day celebration was transformed from a one-day work activity to ele uh, elaborate three-day work, uh, three-day weekend luau. Nice. So every Memorial Day weekend, hundreds of Polynesians and those interested in Polynesian history, uh, wow. about 1,000 and 2,007 gathered wow. at the site for the celebration. Restrooms and a large concrete pavilion were added in 1999 for the festival, and the association has plans to further improvements to welcome growing crowds. Camping is encouraged, and visitors, visitors are always welcome. So, huh? sounds like they turned it into a memorial place for the Polynesian history, culture. That's uh, awesome. That, their, their history goes back quite a ways, pretty much just as much as everyone else's. Anyone else on this earth, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know? That's They've been all over the world. I mean, before they got to the islands of Hawaii and other places, they were, I'm not sure where they came from, but they came from other places. So, they Outer traveled space. the world. They, they were dropped here by aliens. Yeah. Polynesians have traveled the world. Yeah. And you know what? Polynesian people, they're some of the nicest people I've ever met. Like, oh, yeah. they're huge and everything, and it's kind of intimidating. But, you know, they're like, oh, my gosh, so great to meet you. And it's like, holy cow, these people are so nice. Yeah. Like, most of them are like that, you know? Well, my dad's side of the family is my dad's um, half, well, I'm about a quarter Polynesian. I get a quarter Hawaiian. So going back to Hawaii, my dad's family is, you know, I'm, all the, that's where all my Polynesian blood comes from over there. Can you do the haka? Uh, I never got to learn that. <laughs> 
<laughs> that would I, freak I spent, me out if spent, I saw somebody. Spent too much time that. in Utah. Not enough time in Hawaii. Can you imagine being a warrior back then? Like back, way back then. Like on the other side from from the people. Uh, oh my gosh, I would be I would be scared to death if I saw all these guys doing that, sticking their tongues out. <laughs> Man, my buddy Sione. I used to work with him. He uh, he's Polynesian. His name's Sione. But he uh, he he did his haka a little bit one time, and he actually scared me. I was like, "Holy cow! Okay, stop, but please." It's very intimidating. I mean, you see the Hawaii football team; they do that before every game. And man, I'm surprised they don't scare those other football players on the other team away. Well, they do, but they they can't run away. But they're hiding their <laughs> their fear inside. I would be. I'd be like, <laughs> Some "Big crazy looking boys over there." <laughs> so okay, so that's uh, Giuseppe. That's. Um, Pretty good information, and so yeah, if the, you guys want to check that out, uh, I didn't know it was on Memorial Weekend when the uh, Memorial Day was, but that makes sense. So yeah, if you guys aren't doing anything Memorial Weekend, head on out there. And see. Yeah, I might just do that next Memorial Weekend. I didn't even know that till we researched this. So. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. See what researching does? No. <laughs> um, so the next one we have... So that's, um, that's it for our ghost towns, right? Um... Yeah, that's it for ghost towns. So there's like, like we said before, there's hundreds of them around here, but we picked, you know, four of them that we could, we don't have too much time. But. Yeah, there's, there's so many. Um, a lot of them, though, um, they just have like a couple little rocks sticking up or, you know, foundations or something. But, you know, that doesn't make them any less creepy, you know, when you go out there at night or something. Yeah. So, but, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and talk about some haunted locations. Uh, we would be here until next month if we talked about them all. Um, so I'll, you have some to, that you want to talk about and I have some that I, that I was researching. Um, so yeah, we'll go, we'll go ahead and get into that. Uh, you ever heard of Cove Fort? Never did until you gave me this list. Cove Fort. Um, I was actually taken there by uh, the person who gave me the unreliable information about the temple, but we went there to Cove Fort and I had never heard of it. And it was, it's really cool actually. Like the way that they did the construction back then, like you can literally see all the rocks that they got from the area. Um, there's a lot of volcanic um, rock out there in the area and they use that to build, to build the fort. Um, and if you want to see a picture of it, Mike is going to post a link on the on the page it's really cool looking um but it's it's located approximately 30 miles um south of fillmore that's by beaver as well fillmore beaver fillmore is about two hours south of salt lake city that's an inside joke in utah by the way you know fillmore, fillmore beaver. beaver um <laughs> yeah so um so the rock fort like i mentioned it's um constructed with a lot of volcanic rock um, that was in the area. It was built in 1867. And the main reason why it was built is to protect the telegraph lines and to house weary travelers that were traveling in between Salt Lake and, and St. George at the time. Because, you know, you can only go like, what, one mile an hour? <laughs> no, they didn't, they, didn't have, they didn't have cars that do 90 miles per hour back then. Yeah. So, so you had to stop off. It took you a couple days at least maybe two or three days to get from st george all the way up to salt lake and they had to have things in between you know to to stay because it was hostile indian country back then it yeah. was really really dangerous think of them like rest stops like we have on our, our highways now pretty much you know, rest stops stop and catch a little nap and take a little bathroom break yeah no electric vehicle chargers though <laughs> so i mean that'd be cool if they had those back then though um so the Mormon church um, called on some families, uh, pretty much everything that was built here. Brigham Young called on the families. We want to start a settlement over here, you know, so people can stop there. And so they won't get killed by the Indians, basically, um, you know, camping out in the open. So they built a fort. They built a ranch. And um, the uh, guy who was responsible for, like, forming the the first party to go there and start building this fort was a guy named Ira and Hinckley and Gordon B. Hinckley is I'm sure their descendants, you know? Um, so Ira and Hinckley, he had a home in Colville. He disassembled his log cabin in Colville and hauled it all the way down to where Cove Fort is hmm. and reassembled it. Um, wow. and he stayed in there while they were developing the land and building the fort. Um, so inside the fort, it's really cool. Uh, you can see recreations of the telegraph office. There's a large kitchen, 
several homes with your period decorated like it shows their beds and all this stuff and i'm every time i see these old places and i see their beds they used to sleep in i'm like because i got a king size and that's almost not enough for me you know but this is like a twin bed and mom and dad would have to sleep in that bed and it just looked very uncomfortable i uh, mean Maybe that's why nobody was ever smiling in those pictures back then. But um, there's definitely some some kind of energy there. Um, I felt a little weird in some places when we were there, especially when we were looking into the, the places where they had all the old artifacts, all the old dishes and dresses, you know, and stuff like that. I'm a firm believer in energy, and I believe that energy was still all over that stuff, you know. Um but visitors who have seen things there, they've reported, um, you know, seeing the ghost of an old man walking through the courtyard. Like there's a tree in the middle of the courtyard and it's been there for a long time, but they, they see a man walking around that area. I think it's Gordon Hinkley or what's his name? Ira Hinkley. I think it's Ira Hinkley. Um, but that's Cove Fort. It's a really cool place to explore. Yeah. I'd like to check it out. It's, it's been re rebuilt, I guess, um, or Re, not rebuilt, but the uh, uh, restored restoration. So I gave you the Cliff Notes version. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, you hit pretty much a lot of what you, uh, what's on here, but um, here's a little uh, something for you. The fort is a square. It's 100 foot on each side. The walls are constructed of black volcanic rock and dark limestone, both quarried by nearby mountains. Um, it's one of the only places that was built all stone. Um, usually, you know, you built with wood and everything, but they built also because it was a fort. They needed protection from those engines. Those walls are 18 feet high and four feet thick at the base, tapering off, tapering off to two feet thick at the top. You can actually take the stairs up to the top, too, and across the gangplank. Well, it's not really a gangplank. I don't know what they call it, but... Like the watch out. The catwalk watch, or yeah. some, something. The fort has two sets of large wooden doors at the east end and the west end, originally filled with sand to stop arrows and bullets. Smart. And contains 12 interior rooms six on the north wall and six on the south wall as a daily stop for two stagecoach lines as well as many other travelers cove fort was heavily used for many years often housing and feeding up to 75 people at a time providing a west rest place like we talked about um there was a blacksmith that resided at the fort uh who you know put your your uh horseshoes and fixed up your your yeah. traveling Everything. animals and yeah anything metal repaired anything. wagon wheels and the telegraph office and as a, it was also a pony express stop nice another thing um when you go there they kind of tell you a story about the place and this isn't in any of that stuff or anything that i found but one of the stories they told um they built the fort to begin with to, as protection from the Native American tribes that are around the area, the Utes, um, the Navajos, the Paiutes, um, whatever else was around there. And so um, one time, one day, there was a, a very sick and injured, um, I'm not sure if they were Navajo or not, but a Native American came to the fort. And the people who were there, they wanted to kill the Native American. But Ira Hinckley said no. Don't kill him. Bring him in. We will feed. We will clothe him. We will let him rest and get better here. They let him get better, and uh, he left. And next thing you know, there's other Native Americans coming over there. And basically, to put it in today's times, they were like, yo, man, you, you did our brother a solid over here. Like, you saved his life. So now... We're not mad at you anymore, <laughs> you know? And so... Um, That's all it takes. Just be nice. Yeah. And so they, they from that point on, they had a, a policy there at, at Cove Fort that no matter who it was, Native American, um, American, anybody, anybody could seek shelter. And if they were hurt, they could get, you know, the, they could heal there. And so that really, really improved the relationship um, with the Mormon church and the Native Americans at that time. And, and it is open for guided tours. It says here, in 1988, the Hinckley family purchased the fort, donated it back to the church. This church restored it and then transported Ira's Hinckley's um, Colville cabin to the site, yep. constructed a visitor center, and uh, the, site, the site provides free guided tours daily, starting at 8 a.m. And The uh, artifacts what? they have here um, at the place is awesome. I'm an antique guy. I'm yeah. like, my mouth is like watering when I'm, they have so much like China 
and old furniture and paintings and books. Um, it's incredible if you like that sort of stuff, but um, it's all behind glass. <laughs> uh, there's some places where you can kind of walk in, but you have to stay where the ropes are, you know, um, which is fair because people are crappy sometimes and they do <laughs> stuff. So, but that's cool for it. It's, it's a, it's a cool place. Um, but yeah, maybe if you can see uh, Gordon or uh, Ira Hinckley, the ghost of Ira Hinckley when you go Yeah, there. so if you want to see if you can uh, go to an old historic fort and find some ghosts, that might be one place to go. Yeah. So the, uh, the next one on our list, I wanted to get kind of like off the wall places, really, that's not like mainstream, you know. Um, so if you do decide to go to these places, you don't have to like wait in line for the thousand cars that are going there, too, you know. Um, but this one is pretty cool. There's a lot of history at this place. Uh, it's kind of up over by my mom and my dad's house. It's called the uh, Clearfield Job Corps Center. You know what Job Corps is? I actually went to that Job Corps when I was younger. It's a, it's a school for, for bad kids. So Micah must have been bad. <laughs> not bad. Just uh, not on the right path. He, was, he, strayed, he strayed from the path of righteousness. So if you don't know what Job Corps is, it's for um, younger uh, kids, Troublemakers, kids that uh, kind kind of are uh, I don't know, not on the right path. I guess not on the right path, but uh, they yeah. go to the job corps and they, they teach you a trade, um, and then they put you. They give you some skills so when you go back out into the workforce. You've got some skills to. Yeah. Um, they help you get a job, all yeah. that. So it's a pretty cool place. Um, you know who went to job corps center? I did. Well, you did, but you know who else? <laughs> I didn't go very long though. I I actually ran away from it, but. <laughs> That, that explains a lot, you guys. Um, <laughs> I still turned out good. <laughs> yeah, you did. I agree. That's fair. I agree. Um, but there's a really famous person that went there. Do you know who it is? Have I, you heard that? I do not. Um, let me see if you can guess. He's got a whole bunch of indoor smokeless grills that you can cook your food on. That doesn't... George Foreman. Oh, really? He went to the Clearfield one. George Foreman was a horrible kid. He was such a bad kid. Like, they thought that he was going to end up in prison. Like, you know, he, he grew up in, in the ghetto, basically, and he, he did not have any role models at all. He was always fighting people. Uh, he was in the Job Corps Center. Uh, he still continued to fight people there. And I'm not sure whether he graduated or got kicked out. I'm kind of guessing he probably got kicked out there. Um, but yeah, he went on to become a famous boxer. Hmm. Yeah. Which, well, we all, I know who George Foreman is now. Yeah. Everybody knows George. He's one got time, 12 kids and they're all named George. One time heavy, <laughs> heavyweight champion. Yeah. Yep. So, so getting into this, um, part, um, basically job Corps center was, um, part of an old naval base. And that's kind of weird because we're not by the ocean. However, we have Hill Air Force Base over there. So there's a lot of military presence actually in Utah. Um, so it was an old naval base, and it is believed to be haunted by many ghosts. So um, notably, there are three spirits who linger in Dorm E. Okay, so if you can go there and they let you in, you can go to maybe we can do that for an episode one time and carry a yeah. camera with us. Maybe we can do a podcast slash like ghost adventure. I don't remember what know. dorm I was in, but uh, I don't remember. You were in Dorm F for failure i was too much <laughs> spent too much time causing trouble and didn't notice the ghost so you were in jo dorm f no i'm just kidding <laughs> so dormy a young girl uh they say bounces a ball in the hallways and an ra what does ra stand for uh, resident assistant or something i think something like that resident yeah. assistant um who likes to check on the students visitors into their rooms when they're going there and another ghost who has not been identified um, and a nurse's spirit is also said to reside in Dorm L, wearing old-fashioned clothing, which makes sense if, you know, it's a ghost. I wonder how many dorms they have there. Does it go through A through Z? There's a lot of dorms there. I mean, it was an old uh, old uh, naval facility, so there's, I think they're even, they don't even fill all the dorms, as far as I, I, I believe. And I, was, I actually tried to look some of this up online, too, and I couldn't find too much on it, because, um, you know, it's, just, it's a job corps, but... Um, it looked like a lot of it is abandoned right now or under renovation. Yeah, they're renovating. It's still, it's you know, still going on. Um, they're still helping kids and stuff, yeah, but it's it is there. so old. Um, they have to renovate it every now and then. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they closed it for a little bit and or stopped taking so many students while they you know redo the dorms. Yeah, but yeah. old place, um, 
you can't miss it if you turn you're on uh i-90 or i-95 geez i'm in virginia i-15 north you get off on antelope drive in clearfield you make a left and you just keep following it and you'll see it on the right once you right, go over right past it yep so so that's uh clearfield job course center um the next one this is an odd place uh it's called bell printing and design and that's like a, a print shop in layton and i imagine i don't think the owner well maybe they will because a lot of people know that it's haunted i'm not sure if they'll let you go there and like hang out or anything like that but maybe if you gave them some business they might let you do like a a ghost hunt there maybe one night but um the haunting reports at bell printing and design in layton because remember even if a building's there the the ground might be haunted there might have been something happening in that ground before that building was even built you know or it's in the building and the building is really old so but the haunting reports at bell printing and design and layton um include strange laughter uh apparitions and being touched by something unseen Ooh. can you imagine being there at night like closing up like you're the manager and also near <laughs> Oh my god that would freak me out again i would poop my pants <laughs> so um, but those are the kind of scares that i like actually like kind of like jump scares and stuff like that can you imagine being in there getting a print job done and something's like getting a print job <laughs> i said print job micah jeez i know <laughs> i know where you're going with that man I don't know. So that's Bell Printing and Design. Not a whole lot on that. Again, um, if you really wanted to go check it out, that might be a cool place to see if you could talk the owner into doing like a lock-in or something, you know? Like lock in there at like 9 o'clock at night and come back and they'll unlock the door at 7. And whatever happens, happens. That might actually be kind of cool. Scary. That might be cool, actually. So the next one, a lot of people know this place. The Lion House. The Lion House in Salt Lake. It is a beautiful, beautiful building. Um, but it was built for Brigham Young and his many, many, many wives. And that's where they all lived. It's crazy to think about. Like, oh, I, can't, I can't sleep with you tonight, honey. I got to sleep with wife number two. You know, like, he must have been tired all the time. He had so many kids. Oh, that's, why they, that's why they all haunt him now. I haunt the place now. Probably. My gosh, he had so many kids. But Brigham Young was very, obviously, he was affluent. He owned pretty much everything in Salt Lake because he was the president of the Mormon church at the time. But So this historic home, again, it's very beautiful, but it now operates as an event venue for weddings. Um, it's got uh, got a restaurant in there. Um, but what people have said happens there. They've seen shadowy figures walking down the hallway, and some also claim to hear a man clearing his throat, like <clears throat> something like that, when he's hmm. when when he doesn't think anyone's around. That's so, right, Brigham Young. I mean, he spent a lot of time there. You know what I'm saying? Disembodied voices and sounds. Brigham Young put a lot of miles in that house. You know what I mean? <laughs> So if you ever want to check that out, um, any of these haunted places, I would go there with a camera and just start snapping pictures, you know, because you never know what you might catch. Anything you want to add about the, the lion house? No, nope, no, nope, we got so many. Let's, we'll just keep going through keep these. Keep on cruising yeah. through these. So uh, another one is Union Station in Ogden. And then we will go into Union Station in Salt Lake. I'll let Micah talk about that one. But I will talk about um, Union Station in Ogden. <laughs> So this uh, train station has been rebuilt a few times because of fire damage and age, but the original building was built back in 1869. It's a beautiful building. Have you seen that one? Yeah. It's really, really nice. Uh, everything huge. was built by brick back then, you yeah. know? So it's solid brick, uh, very good, nice architecture on there. But it's now a museum, and uh, it was the site of the 19... It, the train that left that station uh, was involved in a 1944 train wreck called the Bagley Train uh, Disaster, which actually killed 48 people, um, injured 79 more. So um, kind of giving you the Cliff Notes version of the Bagley Train Disaster, it was a dark and stormy night, and it was very foggy, and it was very early in the morning, and the train that was leaving um, Union Station in Ogden was one hour late, okay? 
It was very foggy. It was hard to see the train signals. There were two trains that were trying to converge onto the track going out into the West Desert, okay? And so the first train, uh, not the one that left um, Union Station in Ogden, but the other one, it was uh, heading to California, I believe it was from Denver. It, it started going and it saw the signal to slow down, okay? Um, because uh, of fog and everything like that. Well, the, the train that was leaving Union Station in Ogden was kind of in a hurry. They were going a little bit faster than they probably should have because they were running an hour late. Anyway, the, the, the Coleman, the fire tender, they're also a lookout too for the signals and things like that. He didn't see the signal. And so this train, the first train slowed down to about 20 miles an hour. The second train was going about 50. And so it ran right into the back of that other train. It was like, you know, it basically destroyed the last three cars on that train. And each train was holding about 17, 18 cars. And so um, all those people died. Hmm. A lot of military people on there. Um, it, was, it was a very, very big disaster. So, um, but the actual station itself is rumored to be haunted by a woman who walks in the halls upstairs and apparently she only talks to guys. Nice. So if you're a girl, forget about it. Um, but witnesses have also claimed to hear children playing uh, very loud bangs. Can you imagine walking in there and it's all quiet and just hearing bang? Yeah. Oh my God, I would jump out of my skin. And unexplained footsteps and also just poltergeist activity. Not quite sure what poltergeist activity entails, but I have seen poltergeist, and if it's anything to do with that guy with the white hair, I don't want it. <laughs> you know, Colonel Sanders, Colonel Sanders skeleton style. <laughs> For those of you that didn't know, the first Kentucky Fried Chicken was here in Salt Lake City. Boom! It's still there, Harmon's KFC, well, thirty three hundred South State Street. They actually have a museum over there. I don't know if anyone knew that or not, but there. I didn't know there's a museum. Well, it's not really a museum. I used to deliver Amazon Flex. And I had packages one time, and I delivered it to that place. And I walked in, and I was like, oh, I've never been here before. And I was like, so th is this the corporate for KFC? And they were like, yeah, for this area it is. And I was like, that's really cool. And I turned around, and they had these big glass cases full of all this old um, Kentucky Fried Chicken memorabilia. Cool. I'll have to go check it. Probably worth a lot of money. I was like, holy cow, Colonel. When it comes to fried chicken, though, I prefer my wife's. But, Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, I, haven't been to, I haven't been to KFC in a while, but yeah, the very uh, first KFC yeah. was here in, and they name it Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? But it's the first location was here in Utah. Well, Colonel Sanders, kind of getting off track here, he he tried to peddle his chicken all around the country using a pressure fryer. He was the only one at the time that was pressure cooking fried chicken, and he had so many failures of trying to do it. Finally, he came up with the perfect recipe. If you heat it at this certain temperature, cook it for this amount of time, it's going to come out perfect every time. And so what he would do is he would he sold his pressure cookers and the seasonings to all these places across the country. And then finally, he came out here to Utah and Harmon, the guy who owns Harmon's, started Harmon's grocery store. Mm -hmm. He actually befriended Colonel Sanders. And back then, Colonel Sanders was already an elderly guy and he was an alcoholic. He was a womanizer. He wasn't really a very good, well, he was a good guy, but he wasn't on the right track, so to speak. And this guy, Harmon, kind of took him under his wing, and they started Harmon's KFC. So, yeah, very first KFC in the world. I wonder Salt if Lake it's City, haunted. Utah. It might be. It <laughs> might be. And for those that don't know, either the world's biggest Costco is in Salt Lake City, too. That's not haunted. So, it might be. Well, you never know. It's a huge place. Never know. I mean, the land here is old, too. You know, it might be haunted. So, you never know. So, the next one, like I said, I wanted to get some off-the-wall stuff. Um, the next one is up in Brigham City. It's north of Salt Lake, about an hour and 20 minutes or so. Um, I like to go to Brigham City because there's a really good restaurant over there called Maddox. You keep telling me about this place. Maddox, forget about it. Oh we'll, have to, we'll have to do an episode on that one. Oh my gosh. Maddox, remember that. They've been around for 70 years. They raise their own beef. They're one of the only restaurants that actually serve a T-bone. Oh, so good. So anyway, this place is up in Brigham City. It's called Idle Isle Candy. And strange things are said to happen at this cafe and candy company after it closes at night. 
Furniture is known to move or be knocked over. Objects fall off the shelves. And a Native American's apparition has been spotted, which I wouldn't doubt. There's, you know, before we were here, they were here. These were Native American lands at one time. Yep. And stories say that the ghost once appeared to an employee of the cafe, ordered some dinner rolls, and disappeared. Wow, I didn't know ghosts <laughs> like dinner rolls. Changed his mind, I guess. <laughs> I wonder if they have really good dinner rolls. You never know. It must not have been that good if he changed his mind. Maddox has great dinner rolls with raspberry butter. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, so, the man, actually, that ordered the dinner rolls, uh, people have seen him in businesses next door to Idle Isle Candy. So, you never know. He might have just been an owner of one of the shops or a resident that used to go there back in the day, and he just likes to visit them all. And... Uh, the owner's grandmother, the lady who started the, the Idle, Isle Com- Idle Isle Candy Company, has also been seen there. Nice. That'd be, wouldn't that be crazy? Like, if you knew your grandmother or your grandfather, whoever, and they died, and then all of a sudden you saw them. I would like that. I would like it, too. I wonder how that would feel. I would like it. That would be like, do you think they would be like, you ever seen Pet Cemetery? How they bury the, yeah. the, the, the cat and it's... Nice before, but after it's like, you know, like comes that. back as a crazy zombie cat. Yeah, like, do you think the ghost would be like friendly to you? Be like, oh my god, I missed you so much. Of course, much, yes. Honey. Huh. Well, I don't know if they would be like that all wishy washy. I'd be like, yo, grandma, can you help me out here? Tell me what the combination to this safe is. I want you to hang out here and What's watch, <laughs> watch what? somebody open it. What's the what's the, the the lottery numbers? Yeah, what's the lottery numbers? Yeah, I don't know if they could do that, but they could certainly could watch over somebody's shoulder, you know, watching them open a safe and then tell me the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if we can make some contact with our ancestor ghosts. That would be pretty cool, actually. <laughs> like, I'm like, I wonder what you know. I'm I'm related to John Lafitte. You know who John Lafitte is? I do not. He was a pirate back in the day. He's very famous. There's a lot of books and movies about him. But he helped um, uh, President. Uh, Jack Jackson um, defend the the New Orleans from the British in the Battle of 1812. Andrew Jackson, and uh, yeah, so he was wanted, but he helped to defeat the British, so they pardoned him. Cool, and he turned into a pirate again. <laughs> What's that saying that we're friends? Fr- Friends to the same enemy, or I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But there's still his old blacksmith shop there was actually where he kept all of his stolen goods. Um, it's actually the oldest bar in America. It's in New Orleans. It's called Lafitte's. Go see it. Anyway, back to Utah. So the next one, I actually really want, I've heard a lot of stories about this place. Um, one of my old uh, supervisors actually did his college thesis or dissertation, whatever you want, whatever you want to say on this place. It's uh, the Mountain Meadow Massacre. Um, did you know about this? I've heard, I've heard about it, but I don't know too much about it. So the Mountain Meadow Massacre, um, it's a historical landmark. It marks the spot uh, where it's at. But on September 11th in 1857, over 100 emigrants were massacred by Mormon militiamen, and they were dressed up like Native Americans. So. If anybody saw or any reports got out, they would think that the Indians, it was the Native Americans that, yeah. that, that the Indians did it. And so, the story that my old supervisor told me about this, um, he'd done a lot of research on all this stuff, but they didn't. The Mormons didn't like non-Mormons traveling through Utah through their area. So that's why they set up all these things all the way across so they would know who was traveling. I, I think they were a bit paranoid back then, too, because they were so persecuted back in, was it Missouri? They came from Missouri, and they were per- persecuted and just wanted their own life, and people leave us alone. So I think they were a little bit paranoid, too. They were persecuted, uh, like, in they were persecuted everywhere except for Utah, yeah. basically, in Nevada, everywhere, because everyone knew Mormons. They knew they were polygamists. They thought it was wrong. So that's basically that. So they were very paranoid. And... Um, so what happened way back when was a, a wagon train was passing through the area and um, they had been tracking this wagon train for a few days and they sent a messenger up to Salt Lake to ask Brigham Young what they wanted to do to, you know, should we let him pass? Should we, what should we do? So he rode as fast as he could from there. This is in Southern Utah, like, few hours away by like three four hours away by car right and so it took took a couple days for him to get back here brigham young said let him pass 
the guy who was left, the guy who was in charge of the militiamen down there, he was getting very impatient. He didn't think that the messenger was going to come back on time. So he made an executive decision. You know what his executive decision was? Take them out. Kill all of them. So they killed all 100 immigrants, women, children, men. They were wearing feathers in their hats. So anyone would think that they were Indians. Um, so they slaughtered them all. Then the messenger got back and said, what have you done? Mr. Uh, President Young told them to pass. Let them pass. And the, I'm not sure what happened to the guy that, that ordered the slaughter, but, um, but that's what happened. So and now those grounds are haunted. Very haunted. Can you imagine that? So, you know, uh, witnesses claim to hear the cries of women weeping. Um, strange orbs of different colors darting in and out of the sagebrush and juniper trees. Um, just a very solemn, like eerie feeling in that area. I've, I haven't been to that um, monument yet. I would like to though. That's yeah. that's pretty sad. Check actually. it out. Yeah. That's pretty sad. Some Utah history. Some not so good Utah history there. Yeah, yeah, not not so good. But but it was good of Brigham Young to allow them to pass. Wasn't good for that guy to be impatient. I hope he got tarred and feathered. Yeah, he probably got a couple wives taken away. And you get three of your wives taken away, boy. <laughs> what? How could you do that? To no, he was me? probably like, yes. <laughs> he probably was like, yes, I can get some sleep on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> so go check it out. Uh, if you're on a road trip heading back down there, it's easy to put it in the GPS, look it up if you want to do, like if you're, if you're on a mission to go straight down to Vegas, probably not, but if you're... You want to meander down there? You can check out some of these places. You know, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Know your state. Do a weekend little sightseeing tour of the place. And yes. Hit a few places down there. Yep. Uh, another great place, um, the Golden Spike, um, the Dove Creek Camp. Uh, for those who don't know, the Transcontinental Railroad that started in the east, started in the west. We met right at Promontory Point in Utah, and. The railroad was built by mostly Chinese, yes. mostly Chinese immigrants, and they were treated very poorly back then. Um, but they, they built the railroad along with uh, African Americans oh, too. Connected the east and the west. Yes, they did. And the connecting spike was a golden spike. That's what they call it, the golden spike. It was an actual golden spike um, donated by the state of California. Did you hear a few years ago they want the spike back, I heard. Is it still out there? I, I, Hopefully th protected. I want to go get that gold spike. I think so. I think they were doing a guilt trip on everyone. They had a bunch of school kids in California write a letter. We would like our golden spike back. Yeah, forget it. But, you know, this is where this is where they drove it in the ground. This is where it's staying. Yeah. Everyone knows the picture of the two locomotives coming together and people are holding Coke bottles and hanging off like that, right? That was the golden spike, but... Anyway, one of the labor camps there is called the Dove Creek Camp. And this is in a, a town uh, called Corinne, um, small town. And this is uh, this believed to be haunted camp, camp was once a camp for Chinese laborers um, who did build the railroads in the 1800s. And witnesses have reporting seeing a phantom steam locomotive, footsteps, um, voices speaking in Chinese, which I wouldn't doubt. I'm sure there were a lot of laborers that died. There were no regulations back then, so... Um, they've seen tiny lights that spark on the railroad tracks. That'd be creepy. Mm. Um, so yeah, any of these places, I might actually, uh, recommend going there maybe at dusk or something. That's one of the more famous places too. I mean, that's a nationwide historical place over there. Yeah. Yeah. The Golden Spike, um, uh, Promontory Point in Corinne. So if you get a chance, uh, they do have, uh, the Centennial there, the Bicentennial, all that stuff. So they do have celebrations up there for the the certain years you know um cool place so this one this next one it's actually in salt lake it's up over by us um you ever been to uh you've been to the zoo yep it's right across the street from hogel zoo on off of sunnyside avenue um this is the place monument yeah this is park. this is the play when i was a kid it was just called this is the place but when i moved back from virginia it's now uh this is the place heritage park and apparently it was called old deseret Two back in the day. And I'm just going to throw this little fun fact out there before we get into this. Brigham Young, uh, he was wanting seeds uh, from all over the world, everywhere. Everywhere where the Mormon missionaries were all over the world, they wanted to bring back seeds to see if they could grow things here in Utah. Um, they were very into horticulture. 
Anyway, he developed a way to develop, uh, to grow an apple. You heard of the one pound apple pie? No. One, he, he developed an apple that was big enough to make one pie, a one pound apple pie with one apple. <laughs> yeah. And those trees, those apple trees are still over there. Yeah. It's pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah, it is cool. So it's a big ass apple. It is a big ass apple. One apple per pie. And the pies were like, you know, these these Mormon women back then, they could bake like... Oh, they still can. Yeah, they can. Whew. They make some casseroles. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you some of the best eating you'll ever have is in good old... Good old Utah. Good old Utah. Um, Pioneer heritage cooking. You know, one of the things, too, is funeral potatoes. Everyone knows what funeral potatoes are. For those who don't, um, back in the day, they are always served at funerals. But now, I could eat them any time. They're like basically hash browns with sour cream and cheese. I always thought they were called funeral potatoes because when you eat them, you, you oh, they're just to die for. <laughs> I could see that, though. You know, I could die eating them. Well, but keeping with the whole haunted thing, you know, you eat those potatoes, you die. You then, die. <laughs> but you put... Uh, some people put different things on top. Uh, I like cornflake crumbs or cornflakes on top. Uh, makes it crunchy. So it's cheesy, creamy, crunchy uh, hash browns, basically. And they're awesome. They're so good. So anyway, getting back to this is the Place Heritage Park. So it dates back to 1844. And this historic site was, uh, was part of the former Brigham Young settlement and is believed to be haunted by Brigham Young himself. Um. That'd be kind of cool to see him. Be like, yo, Brigham, what's up, man? What's up, brother? What's up, Brigham <laughs> Young? Um, you got any marriage advice? So it was hot. It was believed to be haunted. <laughs> yeah, he'd be like, don't do it. <laughs> uh, no. So it was believed to be haunted by his ghost until um, until the site was moved. And then the hauntings were blamed on his 19th wife. <laughs> so I don't know how many he had all together, but the hauntings are now blamed on his 19th wife, Anna Eliza Webb, who is she's been seen hanging out near the the kitchen window. Have you ever been up there? Mm, I've been to the park. Yeah, it's a pink house. Yeah. It's that pink house, you know, with the big lawn. It's a, it's a pretty cool little park. If you it, ever, it is pretty cool. Want to go check it out? Yeah, it's cool. Um, but they have replicas of the real houses there. Um, and the Brigham Young house, uh, it's the pink one. But they've seen her ghost hanging out near the kitchen. Figures, she was always in there. <laughs> I bet. Um, other reports here include the sounds of a children's party in the Jukes Draper house. You ever seen that that house? It's kind of like I a mean, white. We did a tour of the park. I don't remember each one, but yeah, we, we saw the old the old uh, two hundred year old homes out there. And Pretty cool how they built yeah. this. You know, they're solid. Sheesh. Yeah, they're, they're, still you know. standing and looking good. Yeah, and um, and also an apparition of Mary Fielding Smith has been seen there. So, Mary Fielding Smith. I think she was related to Joseph Smith, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Smith name's not very common, so probably. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard the name Smith before. Um, okay, so that was, uh, this is the place. Uh, they have activities there all the time. Little train ride there. They have like a little mining thing there too. You yeah, one of there? our good friends, Jeannie, used to work out there. Shout out Jeannie, but she used to work out there at the... Oh, she did? Yeah, she did. Um, That's cool. And uh, this was a few years ago. There was a Filipino gathering thing that Rochelle and Jeannie and a few of them put together. I think it's the Ilocano. Uh, Why weren't we invited? That was before I knew you guys. Oh, but geez. anyway, you can oh. you can rent areas out there and she got she got us a little space out there. We could we gathered and did our part our little get together and um, picnic kind of thing. And so it's a pretty cool place. You can you can rent out the different homes. Well not all of them, but there's different uh, event venues out there. The big barn out there you can rent out. There's the uh, some of the lands you can you can uh, Oh, you can get donuts. Yeah. Brigham's Donuts, they're out there. Homemade donuts. Uh, the Huntsman Hotel is out there. That's um, a restaurant. Uh, it's pretty good, but it's a, a replica of the actual Huntsman Hotel. We talked about Huntsman the uh, yeah. uh, first week, I believe, right? Yep. Um, okay, so uh, the next haunted location is called the Alta Club in Salt Lake City. Um, I, I heard about this place when I was... Coming up, it was a very exclusive uh, gentleman's club. You had to be rich to get in there, basically. Um, but it dates back to 1883, and it is a private gentleman's club that is used for business and social interaction among the city's most elite. So I will bet you the Millers go there. What do you think? Well, Millers, the Larry Miller family. They basically own Salt Lake area there, besides Brandon Fugel. But anyway, so stories... 
of the Alpha Club uh, say that long ago, uh, a man fell asleep upstairs with a cigar lit in his mouth, and he set the whole upper floor on fire, and he burned himself alive in the process. So, hope And now a, he haunts the place. So he's having a forever nap now. Um, but there's also another ghost in the basement, and it's a girl, even though it's a guy's club. Uh, they say she makes herself known uh, with the smell of lilac perfume. You ever smelled lilacs? Yes. Oh, my God, lilacs. I have some lilac bushes in my house. They smell so good. But her spirit is also said to touch visitors lightly on the shoulder. Oh. <laughs> so that's that's all I have for mine. Uh, I'm not sure if you can go tour the, the Alta Club or not, but... Um, it is downtown. I guess if you're in the elite club, you can go there. It's a lot of history in Utah. It's a lot of uh, you know older home places and buildings. And, of course, throughout the whole United States, there's all that. But um, I got a few I just want to quickly touch on. If you're right here in the Salt Lake City area, um, so it, I got this off of uh, hauntedrooms.com. It's a website, the Haunted Rooms America, hauntedrooms.com. Sounds scary. And they have the most haunted places in Salt Lake City. So if you're just in the Salt Lake City area, okay. uh, number 10 comes in City Hall. Ooh. City Hall opened in 1894. That's the old gothic-looking building yeah, with the clock on it. If you go downtown, you'll see this. It's a beautiful building. I'll, I'll leave, a, a, again, a link for this and uh, love some the pictures. Old, and the old architecture is so amazing. A beautiful building, yeah. A beautiful building built in 1984, said to be home to at least five different ghosts. 1894, not 1984. Oh, sorry, 1894. Did I say 1984? Yes, you did. 1894. It's okay. Built in 1894 and said to be home to at least five different ghosts, including a pair of children who were apparently killed while playing in the building. Oh, my gosh. Uh, the heartbroken mother is also said to haunt the building with, along with a former Salt Lake mayor, Salt Lake City mayor. Wow. Um, and then they also say they claim to see ghosts of prisoners, uh, perhaps former guards. And haunting the underground tunnel. So there's an underground tunnel there that they are haunting. I'm sure, I'm sure it leads right to the jail. Number Which, nine on the list. Well, they did it back then. You yeah. got sentenced and you walked underneath, go over to jail. Number nine on the most haunted places in Salt Lake City was Fort Douglas. Okay. Fort Douglas is a, was a Civil War era. Or they said the, the, the Fort Douglas uh, was haunted by a spirit of a Civil War era soldier who goes by the name of Clem. That sounds like a Civil War name. Come on, Clem, get your gun. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. <laughs> People have reported a variety of contact with Clem, including feeling his breath on the back of their necks and seeing his full body apparition. I wonder how his breath smells, you know. Number eight was the Gentleman's Club, Alta Club, that you just talked about. Nice. Uh, the Has guy, a picture on there. Again, we're going to send links to everything. Yeah. Another nice, beautiful building. I love the architecture in Salt Lake on the old buildings. So he, again, set the the, the place on fire, and uh, he's believed to be haunting that, and along with the, the little girl in the basement. Yeah, it might be. I'd be haunting that place, too. Number seven is Wins Westminster College. So we have a Westminster College here in Salt Lake City. Uh, Old. Home to a wide selection of ghosts, making it one of the most haunted spots in Salt Lake City. Uh, however, there are seven spirits in the college who are particularly prominent, including a woman in a white who haunts Converse Hall. Ooh, she's, she's wearing Chuck Taylors, too. <laughs> <laughs> she is said to be the bride... Uh, who got married in a Gunston Memorial Chapel, which is very close to where the college now stands. Uh, the bride and the husband were killed after being hit by a drunk driver on their way home from their honeymoon. Oh, my gosh. Uh, another spirit, uh, Jeanette Holst, Hollist, Hollister, Jeanette Hollister Ferry, or perhaps her daughter, Mary Hollister Hancock, was one Hancock. of the driving forces behind Westminster College, and uh, so she said to haunt the place as well. So, you know, back in the olden days, people's last name usually was what they did for a living, right? Like John Carpenter was a carpenter. Bill mm. Baker was a, a baker. But what do you think the Hancocks did? <laughs> well, you know, anyway. You're John <laughs> I'll let you answer that question. I can't. This is a family-friendly show. So apparently, <laughs> most of the... Uh, a lot of the, the buildings are haunted over there at the West, Westminster College. Uh, number six is the Brigham Young Farmhouse, yep, that's, which is the one that's, that's located at the... It's the one where his 19th wife hangs out. Yeah, I mean, This is the place, Heritage Park. Wonder why, wouldn't it be crazy if people saw 19 women standing there and ghosts in a line? They're like, we're all Brigham's wives. 
all of them haunting. <laughs> Standing there by the kitchen. They're like, we're going to get you. <laughs> Number five, Downtown Holiday Inn, Ooh. formerly known as the Shiloh Inn. I remember the Shiloh Inn. Uh, the Shiloh Inn is apparently haunted by ghosts of several children with the 11th fl- on the 11th floor, and the hotel pool is said to be a particular hot spot. Wow. Frequent reports of guests claiming that they have heard the disembodied laughter of a woman. This <laughs> would tie with the story of a woman that once drowned in the pool. Wow. Uh, and child ghosts can be seen attempting to save the woman from drowning. This said something about child-sized handprints being seen somewhere. Oh, geez. As for the origin uh, origin of the childlike ghost, this is easy to explain. Okay. In August of 1978, Rachel David threw all seven of her children off the 11th floor balcony before jumping herself. She had seven kids. And she threw them all off the 11th floor. Pitching them off the 11th floor. Holy jeez. Yeah, that Um, would be some haunting there. I believe so. Wow. Can you imagine seeing that? Can you imagine walking by at that time when they were doing that and just seeing all these kids flying out the window and then what a is, woman? What is wrong with that person? Jesus. Well, uh, it kind of not really comforts me, that but it's too. nice to know there were people crazy back then, too. Yeah, 1978, so. Holy cow. Capitol Theater comes in at number four. Number four, the Capitol Theater in Salt Lake City is alleged to be haunted by a spirit of a 17-year-old former usher named Richard Duffin, who died in the fire at the theater in 1949. Another old, old building. Yeah. Wow. And there's also reports of a second spirit named George, who's a bit of a trickster who likes to cause all sorts of mischief throughout the theater. I wonder what that mischief is. People don't feel uh, uncomfortable or threatened when they're around it, so it seems to be more of a fun spirit number three is the mick mccune mccune mansion that's a beautiful house Holy yeah cow. so we'll again send uh there's links some, for the pictures and some everything. beautiful old historic mansions up by the capitol here in salt lake if you ever get time go through those neighborhoods have you have you done that yeah these yeah. houses are gorgeous I, mean, you, I drive all over the salt lake area so you, you drive past these all the time yeah. the gorgeous gorgeous houses the McCune Mansion dates back to 1910, is one of the most haunted places in Salt Lake City. Really? Popular venue for weddings and other celebrations. Um, but they all stay, says here, they often get uninvited guests in the form of two ghosts that haunt the mansion. The first is a male spirit who is described as wearing a black cape. Dracula. <laughs> Ooh, Dracula's ghost. Uh, he is mainly seen throughout the Christmas season. Huh. Other ghost uh, maybe it's, maybe it's Scrooge. There's another ghost of a little girl who has, has a portrait in the mansion, suggesting she was once a resident there. She was a McCune. She was ten years old. She's approximately ten years old and loved the McCune mansion. Is hosting a she loves when it's hosting a celebration or wedding. Wow! So she likes to hang out with the wedding guests. Scary. This one, uh, the Devereux Devereux Mansion. Well, Number two on the too. list. Very beautiful. Uh, the Devereux Mansion was remodeled over the years, uh, but the oldest section of the house dates back as far as 1857, wow. when a prominent member of the church arrived in Salt Lake City with the first group of pioneers. Wow. And the they mansion, said, build me this house. Yeah, the mansion has changed hands <laughs> over the years and was almost destroyed by a fire in 1979, but has now been fully restored. Um, and so, would love to own that house. The most prominent spirit in the property is a young girl who seems to be something of a trickster. Again, another trickster little spirit. Damn kids. She likes to play pranks on the kitchen staff and has also spotted her at night when she's always happy to offer a friendly wave. Wow. And number one on the list, and actually, I'm going to give a note. Well, I'll have another one after this, but it's okay. not in Salt Lake City area. But number one on the Salt Lake City area is the Rio Grande Depot. Which you talked about the Ogden yep, Depot. Union, union Station in Ogden. This is a Union Station as well, but it's the Rio Grande. So the Rio Grande, it's a train station. Uh, there's a spirit known to haunt there, and they call her the Purple Lady. Wow. She apparently passed away after running in front of a train. Jeez. The story suggests that the it. woman was chasing an engagement ring that had been had fallen and uh, or perhaps thrown onto the tracks, and she did not realize the train was coming, got in the path of the train, and bye-bye. How could you not know a train is coming? No. Well, <laughs> that's the story. Huge. Anyway. That's and back the story. then, it's like... Tow, 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 you know? So those were the 10 most haunted locations in wow. Salt Lake City, and I'll again leave a link to the... Uh, 
to this in the description below. But lots of haunted for history. our last location, there is a haunted ghost tours in Salt Lake as well. We did that one time. Um, I hope they've actually improved it because I wasn't very impressed uh, with the people who were running the ghost tour. Um, the way they told their stories was annoying. <laughs> but so there is a ghost tour. Hopefully, uh, like I said, there's somebody else doing it. But um, there's so many more haunted places here. It's it's uh, crazy. So I want to touch on the uh, the old Tooele Ho the Tooele Hospital mental hospital. So this one is I believe is has was rated as the ha most haunted location in Utah. Yes, or at least in the top three. You know, back in the day, if you were nuts, you didn't have any say. They strapped they called the the paddy wagon and they took you away in a straight jacket and locked you up threw away the key so the old Tooele hotel or hotel the whole Tooele hospital um started insane out asylum 1883 in utah uh, back in the gold rush miners days it was a hospital turned into an insane asylum um and then over the years it kind of it Lots shut of bad down things happened there when they were in a sane asylum yeah but now they've turned it into a actual haunted house. You like you know those haunted houses you see every Halloween. It's called the um, Asylum Forty Nine now. It's actually featured on the Travel Channel. Yeah, it's one of the cool places to visit. During and actually, Halloween. I don't know if you ever watched the Ghost Adventures TV yes. show where Zach and the boys got and check out. So they went to this place and Zach they, Bagans. They did a show out there. I'll leave uh, I'll leave some uh, links for that. You can go watch the episodes of that. Um, but that is uh, now it's a haunted house. You can actually go there during Halloween and pay your whatever twenty dollars a ticket or whatever it is now and walk through that place get scared get scared by all the people dressed no. up but, but there's actual real spirits there as well there was a story on the the travel channel of one of the guys who was working there he uh you know in the uh, haunted house he said he went to a part where they weren't supposed to go and almost immediately he was scratched like three big huge deep scratches down his back through his clothes by the way and they looked just like uh like he didn't have his shirt on, so that place is definitely has some freaky stuff going on. So yeah, so this is here the hauntings. So there's a ghost named Wes. Many reports have come from the hospital telling, but telling of an old man known as Wes. I wonder how they know their name. Yeah, well, he's said to be a patient at the elder, elderly care facility, and he suffered greatly from Alzheimer's. Mm. Uh, at the time of his death, he was confused and scared, um, but uh, he is said to haunt the place there. There's a gentleman named Samuel F. Lee. Uh, th as the site once hosted Samuel F. Lee's family home, he actually used it as a home at one time. He was so crazy, he made it his home. Yeah. <laughs> so he is said to haunt the place oh, as wow. well. Uh, it says his son, Thomas. Yeah, seven-year-old son as well been seen lingering alongside his father in the hospital and samuel has been seen talking to visitors telling them all the good things he did during his life he wants recognition for his good deeds wow. there's a couple more there's maria and the portal who oh. perhaps the most interesting of all the haunting is that of a nurse a in portal. white named maria she is believed to guard a portal that has been reportedly seen at the facility the portal is described as being extremely bright and formed as a way to direct the deceased of the building into the afterlife wow so there's maria she's guarding the portal so the nurse is basically saying yeah you can go to heaven or you can go to hell get out of here maybe she's the guardian you know you go toward the light and all that jazz there is also other hauntings. Uh, several other entities are said to haunt the facility. Their names are Richard, James, Ned, Peter, and a young child named Jessica. So this is a pretty haunted oh. place. I mean, there's... They even know all their names, too. Yeah, there's quite a few of them. So, um, Holy cow. If you ever want to go to a haunted place, that's probably the number one place to go. I hate going to haunted houses, so, you know, it scares the crap out of me, and I don't like it. But... Um, I haven't gone to that place, and I don't really want to. But if you really want to get scared, go to that place. That there's some bad energy there. Yeah, and then they turned it into a, a real ha a Halloween haunted house. There's some bad juju there. So you there. can walk through a haunted house in a real haunted house, a haunted hospital, and get scratched. Crazy. Punched. That's actually maybe. one I've always wanted. I want to go check that one out. We got to go do that one. We don't have to go to. I, I think they have tours and during the non. Halloween time, so you can go through and yeah. I don't want to see any all the scary crap there, but I will go on a tour <laughs> of the place without all the people in there acting all crazy, you know. 
Jeez, sorry about that. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Drink. No. <laughs> Yeah, if, if we were talking about this before that uh, Derek over here likes to, his favorite thing to say is Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. So me and uh, Rochelle, my wife, were watching our first episode you did, and you probably said at least a dozen times, <laughs> like we got to do a drinking game. Every time Derek says Lord have mercy, you drink. Drink. Now, if I'm really serious about something and really passionate, I say Lord have mercy on my soul. Oof. So that's how you know. That's serious. So, so is that all? Um, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty good. Okay. So what we're going to talk about, or do we have time still? Uh, yeah, almost, yeah, we got just a few minutes left. Okay. Let's talk about some cemeteries real okay. quick. A few cemeteries. One that's up over by us is Magna Cemetery. Um, if you don't know Magna, it's right over by where the, at the foothill of the mines over there. 99% um, of people in Magna own a handgun. Um, if you know about Magna, you know why. But anyway, the Magna Cemetery is a little cemetery. Uh, it's perched on a hill, and it overlooks Magna, and it's full of sagebrush and lizards, and uh, visitors have reported strange orb-like lights and disembodied voices over there, pretty much like every Magna cemetery. Magna itself is a scary place. Yeah, and we, we uh, yeah, it is actually, don't drink the water there if you ever go there to visit. Don't drink I the like water. I like you, Magni, and Magni, and what do you call Magna as people? Mag, mag, Magnanian. Actually, Magna is not too bad now. They've developed they do new, a lot of new development out there. They're, they're, yeah. they're, all the all the bare land out there. They're they're building new houses. So hopefully, hopefully they give it a little more life. There was even talk of doing a ski resort out that way too, in the mountains out that way. I don't huh. know if they're still talking about it, but there was at one time. Well, Magna is on the verge of ghost town. That's kind of like what Magna is. So I'm glad they uh, they're re revitalizing it in the area. Yeah. But uh, so the next one. Uh, Grafton Cemetery. We kind of hit on that one. Uh, Grafton. They filmed Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid out there. Um, so basically, if you're walking toward the cemetery, people have heard uh, like a group of people in a serious conversation. And when they notice that you're there, they stop talking. So another one. Salt Lake City Cemetery. That's a great cemetery. I love that cemetery. This cemetery is old, yeah. old, old. And huge. That thing is big. Huge. Now, the very first burial in that cemetery was in 1847 when George Wallace buried his child Mary here. And perhaps she's the child that's heard crying late at night. And supposedly, you can also see the ghost of Emo here. Have you heard that? Oh yeah, we used to we used to freak ourselves out back in high school going up there. And did you see him? I never saw him. I was too scared to go there. And I mean, but I I know the stories. And I I, I went to the outer the outer part of the cemetery, uh -huh. but I would never could get myself into it. It's it's old. I, mean, I have to do that too. And this was at night. So yeah, we we, we, we might have to night. do that yeah. too. We might have to go do some night stuff. We'll tell the wives like, yo, we're going out. You see the red eyes and all that. Oh my god. Well, that's what they say. If you uh, light a candle and walk around this crypt three times then you peer inside apparently you see some red eyes or something and he's like what are you doing looking at me if anyone's ever tried that and done it and it has happened let me know i want to i want to hear some stories of this place i remember as a younger, don't bs us now make sure it's a I real story as a younger man uh, just outside out right after high school we'd go out there and we would check it out and the story was Let's there go get emo, man. Yeah, the story was there's this church right across the street from the cemetery right where that uh that crypt is that we were told, we heard the story was it was a devil worshiping church. And at night you'd go there and you'd see. Is that the one? Is that the one over where that church is that has the pentagram in the window? Yeah. Oh, okay. And it had that like blue light yeah. coming out of it. And it was yes. really, it was really an eerie looking building. And you, you so. could go there at night and you could hear people in there singing. Um, Whatever they were singing. And, well, you know what? It's the only church that I have ever seen that has a pentagram stained glass window. You know, I never got the full story of that church. I need to get the full story of that church. But anyway, the stories yeah. we were told was that was the devil worshippers church right across the street from the emo's crypt. And to, they were linked together and there was all this bad spirits and juju going on through there. So it freaked me out. I was, I I was exactly where you're talking about. Yeah. That place is a little creepy over there. I'm going to get the real story on that church, actually. All these years I've lived here and I've heard those stories. I need to find the... What's 
one. If anyone knows the real story on that, let me know. Put it in the comments. Yes, yes, that that would be crazy. Another really haunted cemetery is Ogden City Cemetery. You ever been up there? I'm not to the cemetery. No. There's a, a few things that are going on now. The what I researched. Um, I'll tell you what I researched, but then I'll tell you a little bit of something about what I've experienced myself. So basically, uh, visitors have seen a, a friendly woman who's walking around in a blue dress. Um, and she's dressed in vintage clothing from like the 1930s and she'll wave at you and then you'll go to wave back and she'll disappear. Hmm. So that's kind of creepy, but Ogden city cemetery, when you first pull into the cemetery, there's like a roundabout with like, you know, graves in the middle and there's a statue. They say it's a witch statue. Anyway, if you go around the circle, it looks like the head is following you. It looks like the head's spinning around looking at you. Dang. And this is actually where I saw me and a group of my friends. We saw this is where I had my very first ghost experience. Um, not sure exactly where it is in the cemetery, but these two big oak trees are at the end of this path, the cross path. Anyway, the legend is you go down the path where the oak trees are, and about halfway down on the left hand side, there's a grave of this girl who was 14 when she died. Anyway, I can't remember her name, but you read her grave 10 times. And then two of you have to go down there at a time. And then you come back up the path. Well, me and my friend Aaron, we went down there. Aaron, if you, uh, Jody, make sure Aaron sees this. I know you're watching these podcasts. So me and my friend Aaron went down the path. We got to this girl's grave. We read it 10 times. We started walking back up. And I got this weird feeling. And I turned back around. This is what I remember, okay? Aaron might remember something completely different. But I turned around and I looked. And it looked like... There was like a little orb on top of the headstone behind the one that we had just read. And it looked like little sparks were coming off of it. Anyway, it got really, really bright. And then it went away. And we were like, holy cow. And then we saw this little orb thing floating up the road after us. Uh, we started running because <laughs> scared crap out of us. We're like, what is that? <laughs> so we got to the end. Uh, How old were you? We were in high school. I think uh, we were juniors in high school. I'm up 17, 16, 17, something like that. But the legend was the ghost couldn't go past these two oak trees that were at the end of the path. So we're going back up. All of our friends are waiting there at the other side of the oak tree barrier. And we go up and we look back and this orb is still meandering up the road, going back and forth. And then all of a sudden it disappeared. Then a few minutes later, the headstones on the left, um, you know, right behind this little barrier thing, they started like sparking and lighting up and it got really, really bright. And when my eyes adjusted to the brightness, I was just kind of in awe. Uh, I saw the outline of this girl leaning against the tree, like I saw her dress and everything. And I was like, am I really seeing what I'm seeing right now? And my friends saw the same thing too. Hope you remember that, Aaron. Hopefully I'm not BSing here, but this Aaron, is what I remembered. Aaron, let us know if this let, is true. Let us know, Aaron. And then it disappeared. Okay, so it got dark again. And all of a sudden, you know what a rope swing sounds like in a tree? Mm -hmm. It's like, right, right. We noticed one of the branches in the oak tree was going up and down like this. There was no wind, no nothing. Um, and we heard the sound of a rope swing in the tree. Right, right. And we were like, what in the world is going on? And then about one minute later, some bicycle cops came up and were like, hey, what are you guys doing in here? So I will be honest with you. I don't know if the, I don't think the light that was coming up the road was the light off of the bicycle cops bike. We were down, getting down, you know, to, on the, the ground looking to see like, how can these lights come up here? It was impossible. No headlights. Couldn't have been any headlights. I don't think it was the bicycle cop lights. But that was a uh, freaky experience. That, that sounds night. pretty freaky. Uh, Ogden City Cemetery is... Especially for a 16-year-old kid. Very old. Yeah, I think we left there and went and got high because we were so <laughs> traumatized. We were like, we need to get high. We got high just off the experience. Yeah. So, um, uh, oh, another one really quick. I know we're running out of time. This one's up over by us. You've been to Murray Park before? Yeah. Yep. That's the one with the wooden Indian head that's yep. carved right at the entrance. Uh, it's pretty cool, but... This is not a cemetery, but it's just it's just a haunted park. And basically what happens is uh, the ghost of a boy and a girl will appear, and they look like they're wet. And um, you go to help them or take their hand, and they disappear. Like a story from a lady one time. They were having a family reunion there, and they were at the, the Bowery place setting up the food and all that stuff. And 
she felt a tap on her back and she turned around and there was a boy and a girl standing there and they looked wet and um she was wanting to help them find their parents so she was just finishing up what she was doing like she turned back around and then she was going to help them go find her parents they were gone spooky just disappeared and from where she was at there was nowhere that kids could run that quickly to be out of sight and there's uh there's a river running through there too so what was it this the story that they drowned in the river or something i'm that's what i'm guessing i couldn't find anything on the drowning there i'm sure there's something about it but yeah there's a little stream little i don't really wouldn't call it a river it's more of a big stream but it, it's deep enough to where a kid could drown in there yeah so uh anything else you want to add boss i mean there's a ton of places we could talk about but you know we only have so much time but those are some of the ones we picked out for haunted locations celebrating halloween this month for y'all happy oh, halloween oh, everybody oh, 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 oh. it's my favorite time of the year yeah yeah but yeah, I'd, I get uh, scared. I get too scared at this time. We of could year. go on forever on this stuff, but uh, maybe we'll pick out a few of those places and do a more, um, more dedicated show on some of these places. And, yeah, like get all the history of it, yeah. everything that's happened there. We'll take some um, pictures and videos of our own. Yeah, well, actually, I would really like to do the places. asylum, the asylum forty nine. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll asylum forty nine is supposed to be the most haunted place here. Well, you guys might hear me scream like a girl if we do that one. Oh, that would be cool. Lord have mercy. Sure. But, <laughs> but anyway, thank you guys again for checking out guys. this episode. Uh, part of our series of living in Utah, things to do here in Utah. Again, happy Halloween, everybody. Oh. And don't forget, subscribe to the channel. Hit that subscribe link. Give us a thumbs up. Leave us a comment. Is there some ghost stories you guys have that you want to let us know about? Please. Leave them in the in the comments. I'd love to hear these. I love ghost stories. Yeah, so do I. I can uh, hear them all day. Yeah. You know, and, and like you know, I've I've never experienced anything, but I would like to experience something. So if any of you ghosts yeah. are watching this, come let me know. Come on, ghosts. You come on, on ghosts. What you waiting for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you again. Happy Halloween to everybody. Be safe when you're trick or treating. Happy Halloween. Until next time, we'll see you. Peace, peace, and chicken grease. <laughs>